maybe I can just start by asking or first stating that I think you're the first person I'm talking to who does the kind of error detection, let's maybe call it that, or science integrity full time. I think everyone else I've talked to did it as a kind of slightly weird hobby. Um, maybe sometimes as part of like some sort of science journal, uh, like being editor kind of work. But I think you're the first person I'm talking to who actually kind of does this full time. And I'm assuming there aren't that many people in the world who do that. Yeah, maybe could you just kind of briefly provide like a brief bio sketch from kind of your your postdoc work to the point where you went full time um, as doing this kind of work? I did my PhD in the Netherlands. And after that, I worked in a clinical hospital for a couple of years, setting up a molecular lab. And then I moved to the US working at Stanford for 15 years. And uh, I was working in the, on the microbiome of humans and dolphins. And at some point, I found by accident that somebody had plagiarized my paper, a paper I had written. And I was very mad when I heard that. And, and I, I just decided to look into plagiarism as a hobby and, and find tons of PhD theses and papers that had been plagiarized. And then by another accident, I found a, an image that had been reused in a different PhD thesis chapter. It was the same photo, but it had been used to represent a different experiment. It was used in mirror image also. So I recognized a little spot there and I, uh, I just thought, why didn't nobody, why didn't anybody see this? It's the same photo, but it's representing a different experiment that is cheating. And so that uh, led me into this strange hobby of looking at images in scientific papers. And I did this for several years when I was still fully employed at Stanford. I then switched to biotech. I worked um, two years at a uh, in a company that turned out to be a fraudulent company. <laughs> But that's a whole different story. And then at some point, I just uh, I moved on to another Sorry, job. I, mean, I guess the relevant part is that uh, you weren't actively involved in the fraud. <laughs> Maybe that is something yes. worth saying. Yes, worth that is a very relevant part. Um, you know, my bosses or the bosses of my bosses were uh, the founders of the company. And they have been charged with insurance fraud. But none of the employees have. And yeah, so... Uh, I mean, it's also not scientific fraud or anything like that, right? It's... It was insurance fraud. Yeah. So um, double billing people who are on federal insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, which are, you know, that's a federal offense in the US. Yeah. Yeah. So I I, I still was working on, on fraud detection as a hobby or image, image uh, fraud, I guess. And uh, then at some point I moved to another company where I only worked for a very short period. Uh, and I just decided... I want to do this full time because I feel I am making a difference in science. If I can work on this full time, I don't have to do my day job and I just want to do this full time. I will also not have a boss who will tell me what to work on and what not. I hopefully can make more of a difference in science than if I do my regular job. So I just quit my job, wish them all the best and I'm doing it now full time. Yeah, it's interesting making a difference because it's, um, yeah, I mean, you're also really changing kind of the position you occupy in the kind of scientific sphere in the sense of, you know, being one of many, many scientists, let's say, to suddenly being like one of very few people who do that kind of stuff. So almost by being one of the few people who do it, it makes so much more of a difference, I would imagine, than being a regular scientist. Exactly. There's there's many scientists doing regular science, and um, and I think the work that I do is not actually making new science, but but breaking science. So that's how I usually say it. I don't make science; I break science. I criticize other scientists' work. I find concerns with them, and I report them, and I talk about that on social media. Uh, try not to name any names, but make it about the papers. And and I do feel. I'm trying to make a difference. I'm trying to make people aware that there are errors in science papers, but there could also be fraud and that we need to talk about that and correct it and that we need to take a stance against it, that we need to say, this is not okay. We need to address that and make people aware of that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to just briefly ask about something you mentioned earlier in passing, um, which sounds like a very random statement. Um, but I'm curious, like how random it is or how this came about. 
Um, so just briefly, you said microbiome of humans and dolphins. Um, why dolphins? <laughs> well, I worked at the Stanford School of Medicine. So dolphins is not a topic you would typically be working on if you normally work on humans, right? But we were working first on, on the microbiome of humans. So which bacteria live inside our bodies, in our mouths, in our guts, in, on our skin, things like that. And then we were contacted by the U.S. Navy who uh, they were managing a fleet of dolphins. So a group of dolphins that were trained to find underwater objects. And this is a program that has since then been retired. It's not secret. It's all online. These dolphins were trained to find things like sea mines in areas of the world where there has been a war and there are leftover mines on the bottom of the sea that could you know, be uh, triggered by uh, a passing ship. And so they're like landmines. They need to be cleaned up. And so the dolphins were trained because these are animals that can make very deep dives and can then come back up very quickly and report to their human trainer whether or not they had found something. So that's that's what they were trained for. Like sniffing dogs, they were trained to do that task. And the U.S. Navy was doing also a lot of research. So they had a group of veterinarians working with these animals and and checking if they were healthy and checking if there were any health problems, but also doing a lot of basic research. So I guess things like uh, how do you measure the blood pressure of a dolphin? I don't know, like I'm, I'm just saying something silly, but they were they were also interested in what makes these bacteria uh, what what makes these animals sick? Like which bacteria are they supposed to carry? Which would they carry when they're healthy? And what would they carry when they're sick? And a lot of that research had been done on stranded animals, stranded dolphins, dolphins or whales that would end up on a beach and be dead. And obviously that is not a very good topic to do your research on. And so they wanted to know if we just sample these animals, their mouths, uh, their rectum or their blowhole, if we sample that with a little... Q-tip, would you, what would you normally find in a healthy animal so that we can better recognize what would be a bacterium that makes them sick? And, and this, is, this was a relatively new topic. So we were like, sure, sent in the samples. We, you know, they're, in terms of research, they're actually the same as human samples. You just send them in a tube and we'll do the rest. We extract the DNA and do the sequencing. It doesn't really matter from our point of view whether or not it's a human or a dolphin sample. And so I actually almost never saw the, the, the animals. I was not allowed, obviously, to sample them myself. But I was allowed to once visit the facility and see the dolphins. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's just funny that um, I don't think I've ever heard about any, like, you know, sometimes you hear about research if you do psychology and neuroscience. You know, there's some, like, evolutionary stuff and um, or what a comparative cognition or whatever. Um, you know, you hear about different things, but I don't think I've ever heard about dolphins. So I was just really curious when you said that. <laughs> They're um, very intelligent animals. And um, so these were trained to open their mouths or, like, present their their butts to um, to to the trainers and be sampled. And, and they were, uh, yeah, they were... Like I said, they were trained and so they were managed, but they never escaped because they they could, you know, when they were on a mission, they could easily take off, right? But they came back like a dog, you know, you whistle and the dog comes back. So the dolphins did that too. But they're now all retired. So I uh, I hope they live a nice life and uh, I'm not sure where they are now, but the, they used to be in San Diego. So uh, can you say anything? I mean, I don't know anything about microbiology, but can you say something about the, is, is the... I mean, I would assume they'd have quite a di quite different microbiome just based on the, that they eat very different things and are in a very different environment, um, you know, just water versus air. Is that the main difference or are there kind of other differences? So they're mammals. And, and, and what we did is we looked at other studies and compared the dolphins to other studies done by other groups on, on mammals in, in zoos where, you know, you try to link how dolphins in an evolutionary sense of way are related to other mammals and, and would their microbiome follow the same path. And it was very complicated because there's many factors that will determine which bacteria we have in our bodies, uh, specifically in our gut. And one of it is what we eat. Uh, another one is living in the sea. Um, a third one is evolutionary distance to, to other uh, mammals. And so it seemed that it was a mix of all three. So we couldn't really figure out what was determining the most 
um, that made these dolphins look very different in terms of their microbiome. Uh, we also looked at their fish. So we were sent a couple of fish uh, that they were given as food. So these frozen blocks. Well, when they're, it's given to the dolphins, it's obviously not frozen. But when they send it to me, it was frozen in a bucket of dry ice. And so I had to look at these fish. And this was one of the most funniest moments because, you know, I'm usually I would get like a swab or a little tube to extract the DNA of. But now I was getting a whole block of frozen fish. I'm like, how do I <laughs> extract DNA? <laughs> one of those moments where you wish you had somebody telling you what to do, but you, I was a postdoc, so I had to improvise, right? You, and you had to come up with something. So I just thought the, the fish, put it in a plastic bag with some uh, some salt and I um, found this machine that could um, it was called a stomacher so it has these two metal plates that will will pulverize whatever you you put in it it's used a lot in food industry so I did that and ended up with a sort of a fish soup in a in a baggie that I extracted the DNA out of but uh, the the fish had a very different bacteria in them than the than the dolphin so that in the end, didn't provide the answer, but it was an interesting experiment <laughs> to uh, have a bag of uh, frozen fish in the lab. Yeah. Well, I'm glad now I can add dolphin as another species being studied by my guests. I uh, always like when I yes. can add a different Oh, species. you have a list? <laughs> uh, not, no, I haven't written it down, but I've, I've had some, whatever, bumblebees, uh, obviously humans, rats, mice. Right. You know, the typical, yeah, those are the, um, the usual suspects. <laughs> yeah, someone had, what did he, he did? Um, um, God, what are they called? Uh, uh, praying mantis shrimp? No, no, not praying mantis oh. shrimp. That, it's two different mantis species. Shri- mantis shrimp, okay. Mantis shrimp. Oh, okay. Um, dogs, parrots. Yeah, so I'm getting there. Nice. So now I can add dolphin. Okay, great. Anyway, um, Okay, so we, you know, with a slight detour, reached the point where you're now doing science integrity full time. For for most of the conversation, I'd like to talk about, you know, discuss scientific, not necessarily fraud, but anomalies, let's call it, uh, in in more detail, and uh, specifically also kind of the question of what you should do when you find something that looks a bit off or wrong, and you just don't quite know what to do with it, and to kind of use that discussion as a kind of jumping off point for all sorts of topics about that. Um, and I thought the way we could do it is that I actually have something that I'm not sure what to do about. So I thought I'd just kind of in vague terms <laughs> present kind of what I found. And then we can kind of, I, I can basically ask you from your experience what I should do and yeah, use that to discuss other things. So Again, I don't want to do be too specific, but basically it's it's from a field adjacent to my own. Uh, so something I kind of once randomly read and I suddenly saw that like some of the stats just don't add up. Like there's a summary on one point and then like specified another point and they're basically mutually exclusive. Uh, the, the easiest way to put it is that, you know, if you have four points, the average of those four can't be higher than each of those four points. It's that kind of thing. Um, so I was like, okay, that's... That's weird. So then I started looking kind of, I think at the time I just heard about kind of uh, James Heather's Grimm technique and that kind of stuff. So I found like one Grimm inconsistency in the paper uh, where the data points can't quite add up. Um, I also found like just some basic stuff. Like if you have a t-test, some of the, the internal values didn't quite add up from what they reported. So it's just basically a lot of kind of basic small errors that I found in the paper. The paper is from a fairly prestigious journal, I'd say. Um, and its main influence is because it's an area that's it's difficult to collect kind of data in that area, and there is just isn't much like it. Yeah, maybe that's kind of the, the the kind of rough description of the situation. And now I have I'm basically wondering what I should do with this information. I've had this information for a while now. I feel like I should do something about it, but I'm not sure exactly what to do. Yeah. Well, there's there's several things you can do. So the the official thing to do is to write to the editor and just send them an email and saying, hey, I'm concerned about the data in this paper because of these and these reasons. And I suspect perhaps that there's something not quite honest about the paper, or you can word it very neutrally. You could also write the authors, and if you if you really think it might be just an error, writing to the authors might be helpful. But again, 
you don't know what to answer. You can always ask for the raw data because if you are dealing with means and averages, there's probably raw measurements, original measurements, and what would they be? And that could be helpful to determine whether or not that fits the reported data. Uh, and then you could post it online. So I use a website called PubPeer, and you can you can ask the authors there. So it will actually connect with the authors uh, through their email address. And you can ask either anonymously or under your full name what the deal is. Like, hey, this doesn't make any sense. Can you share the raw data here? And unfortunately, the authors do not usually reply. And I think... That is that might be a sign that there's actually something you've discovered something that they are aware of. If it's really all in good faith, they might answer and say, "Hey, yeah, you're right. Let me let me check the data. Here's the data. Oh, yeah, we made an error. Things like that." But for me, posting on Papier, what that the the purpose that I feel that it serves the most is to warn other people that there's a potential problem with the paper, and they might then discover even more concerns. But most importantly, you are warning other people, hey, there is a problem with this paper. If you are basing your research on this particular paper, it might be worth knowing that the data looks like it, you know, something is not right. Don't don't put all your hypotheses on this particular finding. So uh, people can install a plugin, uh, like an inst- a browser extension that will work with your browser of choice. And then you can see if a paper has a Papier comment, it will show a green banner and you can click on it and see what other people had to say about. So in uh, Google Scholar or in where do it, where does it show that? It doesn't seem to work very well with Google Scholar. So how it works is that it will find the DOI, the u- unique identifier of a paper. And Google Scholar doesn't normally show those. But if you go to the landing side of a sort of the the homepage of a paper that usually has the DOI, you will see a green banner at the top. It's not perfect. Um, the you know it's all run by volunteers, so you know you you have to sort of know its limitations. But it works really well in PubMed, which is a, a website that most medical or biomedical uh, researchers will use to do their literature search. So there you will see the DOI in the, on the page. And so it will give green banners when a particular paper has a popular comment. You mentioned earlier, you know, I can contact the authors, I can contact the journal, I can, you know, puppy, et cetera. That's kind of one of the questions I have, because I mean, I actually also wrote down, it seems to me like if you think it's fraud, probably just contact the journal. If you think it's just an error, contact the authors. I don't know. Like how do you kind of how do you make that decision between whether you think something is I mean for example in this case it's it seems to me like the person doing it was just very sloppy to a point where you that makes me question like can I trust anything about this it's not like you know the the statistical in, inconsistencies let's say it's it's not like the the t test changes whether it's significant or not it's not it's not like that it's just slightly off a lot of the time. And so it just makes me like, for example, for me, it's, it's, I just go like, I don't sure I would trust the way they did anything in this paper because the numbers, like the one thing I can look at just doesn't add up a lot of the time. I don't think it's fraud, but you know, like how do you make kind of that value call of who to contact? Uh, uh, yeah, I guess uh, like I don't, I never write to the authors privately anymore. I just write either to the editor or I post on papier or both. So uh, those would be both good avenues. Um, and it's, it, it is hard to make the decision. In in some cases, I'm pretty sure it was fraud just because I do a ton of these investigations and you just get a feeling for, yeah, this is, this is not just sloppy. This is just like, you know really trying to fool the reader and this is intentionally done which makes it misconduct but yeah in some cases when it's just one paper and and like two images overlap or there is a you know a number the numbers don't quite add, add up to 100 percent, things like that that could just be sloppiness uh things that could have been maybe picked up in peer review but they weren't and and maybe it's an honest error but yeah at some point the the number of honest errors if it gets too much then you have to you have to assume it's fraud, but it's it's really a hard call to make. And I think I also don't like 
you know, just going to the journal directly feels like, you know, in school, just going to the teacher <laughs> instead of like figuring it out with the person, you know. But it is the official way, like that is the official way. So COPE guidelines, uh, which is, so COPE is the Committee on Publication Ethics. That is the original way that you should, um, you should contact the editors. And, and decades ago, you would write a letter to the editor, but very officially that would be published where you would raise these concerns uh, but that does take a long time and a lot of editors will not publish it because it might look make their journal look bad. So they, yeah, they might not might. <laughs> be willing to publish it. But officially reporting it to the journal is the best way and then asking the journal to ask the authors for the original data so that you know, you're know you sort of kept out of the loop. The journal then functions as an intermediate. But it is true. I've done this for, for the first 800 papers or so that I found during my, uh, when I started doing this. And of the 800 papers I reported back in 2014 and 15, only 50% now have been either corrected or re retracted. So in, in, and a couple of years ago, that was only 30%. So the, the, it takes years and years and years to address these, these problems if you are waiting for the editor to do something. So that is a frustrating thing. And I, uh, find it now a little bit more efficient to just post it on papier and have at least warned other people that there's a problem with that paper. Yeah, I had, I had one question about time frame. Say I contact the authors uh, or the journal. I don't know whether this makes a difference to your answer. You know, I contact them and, you know, obviously they're not going to respond within an hour, probably not within a day, especially if it's like some something I actually want to look at. You know, academics often don't respond within a week, but like how long <laughs> at, at some point, you know, do you just mail them again and again or? You could, uh, you could try to look up the email addresses of some of the other authors that it usually helps when you have multiple email addresses that you send the email to so that one person cannot ignore the email and they know that the other people are also in the loop and then at least they they know they need to talk about this amongst themselves and so if you include a couple of other people then that might help be helpful to send them a reminder and but yeah we we all have overflowing inboxes <laughs> so yeah, yeah. i i do i do recognize myself that there are just emails you know, at the end of the day, I still have emails that I haven't answered, but the day is over, right? And if that happens too often, it moves to the bottom of the screen and you never answer it. You know, when you contact a journal now, do you have like, I'm assuming because you do it so much, you have like pretty routine things you do, like where you wait X amount of days or weeks until you send another or kind of what's your process there? Or I don't have a standard process, but I keep track of when I sent an email for a particular paper. So I have a spreadsheet of uh, almost 8,000 papers that I'm dealing with. And most of these I haven't even reported to the editor because just every day I get new requests to look at papers. And uh, so around two or 3,000 I've reported to the editors, but the majority I've only reported online on papier because that's my main goal now, just warning other people there's a particular problem with this paper you know fyi proceed with caution <laughs> and um, the reporting to the editor is a lot more work than posting it online because you have to find the email address of the editor and if you have six thousand or so emails to send that is uh that's a lot of work finding all these email addresses <laughs> But uh, if you only have one case, I, I, think say, I don't do have it. these scale <laughs> issues. <laughs> no, I just exactly. randomly found one paper where I was like, this yes, just clearly yes. doesn't add up. Um, uh, so just briefly, you mentioned when you get contacted. So how does, is that just people going like, hey, I think something is duplicated. Do you agree? Or is it, what kind of requests do you get? I get all kinds of requests, usually per email or direct message on Twitter, um, sometimes on LinkedIn, where I tend to ignore it because I just don't log in there very often. Um, so all kinds of, of uh, channels that people come to me uh, with all kinds of problems. So, uh, for example, this morning I had a an email, uh, somebody asking me about a paper that was it looked like a bogus paper to me, but was very outside of my field. It was in, in physics and, and there was chemistry and there was a lot of formulas. And, and those are the type of papers. I sort of have a sense that it might be completely fake, but you don't really 
I cannot really say much because, you know, these formulas all look like, you know, try to dazzle the reader with lots of formulas, but uh, maybe they do make sense. I have no idea. So I cannot really help those types of problems. So I write them back. I mean, I found another problem with the paper, which I posted uh, on pop here, but um, I might also get requests to where somebody said, oh, hey, I found an image that looks photoshopped or it looks weird or it has a line here or blockiness or can you look at it? And those are the things I specialize in, especially if it's molecular biology images, such as um, Western blots or DNA gels or photos of uh, tissues or cells or things like that. I So I will look at those. And if I find a problem, I will write it back and I will post it on Papier. And each one of these problems that I might find might lead to a whole hairball of other problems. So I might follow, let's say, all the papers from the first author or from the last author, and I might find more problems because, you know, if people are photoshopping, they might do it again. And so if I find a real problem, that could lead to maybe a week of of me spending time <laughs> hunting down the 500 papers that these people have written and, and seeing if there's problems in them. And some other tips just lead to dead ends. And I'll see maybe one paper with a problem, but I cannot find anything else from those authors and all the other papers look fine. So if I don't find something in, let's say, the first 20 papers that I scan, then I'll move on to the next topic. Is that then for you also an indication that maybe this is just an error in this one paper? Like, do you use that kind it of... It could be. And like, how much, how lucky do you are? I mean, do you report then everything where you find something or just not enough time so you focus on the you know, the big cases where it's like, here are 20, pe 20 papers with duplications in it? or I do report everything I find that I think is a, an inappropriate duplication or things like plagiarism or uh, all kinds of other problems that you might find in a paper. If I think there's a problem, I will report it, even if it's a small problem and I think it might be an honest error. Because I think if you report it online and you tag the author so they get an email, if it's an honest error most of those people will actually reply pretty quickly and say, thank you for pointing it out. I will look into this. Or uh, you are absolutely correct. We used the wrong blot. Here is the correct blot. And those are fantastic answers. That is what we all hope to see. And it tells me that it was an honest error. But when the authors choose to not reply or send me a very long, um, you know, unkind <laughs> reply of your you're a dissolution person and who are you to question my work and I have 400 papers that I wrote and you're pointing out this little one error. Those types of replies will tell me I've hit a, a good spot. Like I actually found something and there might be more for me to find. So if, if they reply like that, I will probably dig deeper. And that's all based on experience and, and having worked with thousands of these cases. So you're one of the few people who actually enjoys getting hateful email. Because you're like, nice, I... now I've got something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I enjoy it when it's public because at least other people can see it. Uh, it no, I do not enjoy hateful emails, um, you know, as, as the next person. I get a lot of hate online, but I don't enjoy it. But it, it's interesting to see how it seems that honest people making honest mistakes will reply in a very different way than people who know they have been caught. It appears that those folks tend to divert the attention to the error they might have made or the maybe the, the fraud they did and try to attack me, attack the messenger. And that tells me, oh, they have something that they're not willing to share with me. They try to divert attention and it, it it's it's very interesting. But it's not it's not fun for me, to, <laughs> absolutely not to receive uh, you know nasty and unkind messages. Yeah, I mean, I thought we'd talk about this a little bit later, um, kind of the reception of your work, but I guess we might as well just do that now a little bit, if you don't mind. Should, you know, to, to not make it look like you just get hate all the time. Uh, I saw you did get uh, the, the John Maddox Prize in 2021. So it's, you know, it's it's not just abuse. <laughs> so there's also some positives. <laughs> By the way, to do prizes yes. like that, does that like really matter to you? Or is it just like, yeah, whatever, or... I'm curious. I've never won so an award like that. Oh, um, well, first of all, there's not a lot of awards to be won by being a signed critic. Like there's a lot of awards that will recognize breakthrough discoveries and, and you know, fantastic science. There's not a lot of awards, obviously, for criticizing other people's 
science. So the John Maddox Prize in that is 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 a unique one. That's one that really recognizes to be critical of of science or to be critical of certain things that could endanger the integrity of science and doing so in the face of a lot of backlash, in the face of hate and and doing it under very difficult circumstances. So this is the one prize I think that I really was hoping to win uh, because I I feel that's exactly what I'm doing. And I did win it. And that was just fantastic because it's such a great recognition of the work that I do, that I do it in a way that is recognized by the scientific community. So this is an award that is uh, awarded by uh, Sense About Science uh, and uh, Nature, the journal. And so it's a fantastic group of other scientists who recognize that I do important work. And so there's uh, two awards every year, one for more senior person, which is the one I won, and then for a junior person. So people winning these awards, there's only two a year. It's very rare. And it was just one of the highlights of my career to okay. to have that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have... Do you, <laughs> is there, I mean, you said you, you were hoping for that award and also that there aren't many well, awards yeah, like yeah. that. Is that kind of like <laughs> now there's nothing left to win now in this field? <laughs> no, I'm sure there... I hope there will be other awards. No, no. I mean, there. I've won a couple of other awards that are equally... Uh, you know, I have them here on, on, on my uh, cabinet at home and I, I look at them and I think the John Maddox prize was a very big one, but it's, it, for the work that I do, I I work mainly by myself, right? I'm a, I'm a, I'm not employed. I work by myself. I don't get a lot of feedback on what I do other than a lot of these hate tweets, uh, you know, uh, slung at me. So it is nice to hear from the scientific community that the work that I do is appreciated. And I think that makes it worth doing and so whenever i get a lot of these hate emails or hate tweets i will look at my little cabinet with my my <laughs> couple of awards and like okay no the work that i do is important like your colleagues my peers recognize it and i shouldn't really think that these anonymous trolls who who sling insults at me those are not important it's the scientists who recognize my work so it is very important to have won that and and I will. I'm very grateful for all the support that I get from scientists. Mm. Uh, I mean, so you, you already partially answered my next question, um, but one question is kind of how do you deal with online hate, online abuse, <laughs> that kind of thing. I saw, uh, I don't know, a week ago or something. Your Twitter feed, your Twitter was private or something like that. At least a, a few days yes. ago, I wanted to. Two weeks ago, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, was that related to something like that or? Yeah, there was one, uh, it's a long story, but uh, there's this um, set of papers that are criticized that has been used in a biotech company. And that company is also listed at the NASDAQ. So there's a stock of that company. And the company is developing a drug against Alzheimer's. So, you know, it's a very important quest. We we all want Alzheimer's to end. We all have, we all are affected by Alzheimer's. We all have family members uh, that we either care for or have seen deteriorating because of this disease. So it's a it's a horrible disease that there's just no known cure for. So it's a very good cause. We all hope to cure Alzheimer's with this particular drug that is in development. So it's in currently in phase three trials. But I found, um, uh, well, actually, I wasn't the first to find. There was a group of people who found problems in the papers that led to the development of the the drug. So it was a, a scientist working at uh, in New York at a university, and in his work there seemed to be a lot of problems that were in Western blots. So that's exactly what I do. So I was sort of called on Twitter, "Can you can you look at these papers?" And I'm like, "Yeah, no, I agree that these these blots look of concern. Like I'm concerned as well about these papers." And you know, it doesn't mean that the drug does not or will work we don't know but the 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 preclinical work the work done in the lab the work done with the proteins and and patient samples or animal samples that looks of concern so i also wrote i wrote a couple of uh, blog posts about it and long story short of course the the stock was dropping a lot not just because of my blog post but because of other people already talking about it and filing some citizen petition online so the stock had dropped from 120 
one dollars to fifty dollars or so in in one or two days. So that's a uh, a lot of people lost a lot of money investors. So the hate. Long story short, the investors of this company do not like what I did. They don't like my criticism. I mean, I tried to warn them like maybe you should sell the stock and uh, you know invest in something else. But they they sort of formed this group, and there was one particular person. Sorry, very long story, but this one particular person who is the biggest uh, shareholder of this company. So I think he has like over 1 million shares. He uh, started this whole rampage on Twitter, accusing me of fraud because I did work at a fraudulent company. Uh, Again, I was not involved in the fraud, but he sort of was starting to send emails to journalists trying to pitch a story that I was in the middle of the fraud and that they should write a story about that. And I think what he was trying to do is is discrediting me as a science critic and, you know, whether or not I worked at a fraudulent company in the past doesn't really, I think, has to do much with the problems I'm finding in current papers. It's focusing on the wrong things. And and he was trying again to divert attention. So, yeah, so I had to... Attention, exactly, yeah. yeah, I had to shut down my Twitter because I was receiving at some point... He was he was just tagging all these people who whose work I've criticized in the past and and some of them have fans and I was getting death threats and and it just became very uh nasty to look at my Twitter and not see anything positive just very negative things and and just for my mental health I will shut down my Twitter so I cannot see that for a couple of days until the whole thing dies down and then I'll be back there again but yeah Twitter is becoming you know, a lot of things are not moderated anymore, so anybody can just sling insults at other people and it seems all to be okay. So uh, I'm not sure how long I will be there, but I, I do have a lot of followers on Twitter, so it's still where most of my audience is. Yeah, I mean, one thing I found interesting there was that a slight counterweight almost to the general picture that, you know, Twitter's deteriorating. One thing I found interesting there was that the community notes, actually the last time I saw it, I think now the person has made their tweet private or something like that but it actually had community notes that said something like this person is one of the large stakeholders in this company that's been tanking yes. so, yeah that kind of thing so it's actually kind of interesting to see like okay this this thing that they're implementing seems to have done some sort of seems to have worked in this case at least but i don't know yes and 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 he was of course then rallying up his uh, followers to uh, say that the community note that had been added was not helpful in in an attempt to to break down the community note and he accused me of lying and um yeah so it it became this you know he said she said type of thing and then he yesterday he suddenly offered um sort of a a piece and he wanted to collaborate with me i'm like mm-hmm. really you want to collaborate with me that's a big change so i'm like um oh, dude you know Best of luck, but I'm not gonna. You, you, you're calling me a fraud for a month, and now you want to collaborate. Uh, you know, best of luck, but I'm not gonna collaborate with you. Find somebody else. Best of luck. Bye. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the the reason I kind of wanted to ask about this is that um, to kind of the question is like, how do you deal with this kind of stuff? And um, again, as I said, like I've I have no experience with this kind of stuff, but you know, let's say someone. You know, it's always possible. I mean, we've definitely seen these these online pylons where someone does something that was probably a bit stupid, but probably not as stupid as everyone pretended. And then you're in the middle of this kind of thing. So what would you recommend for someone in that kind of situation? It's tough because, yeah, like you said, like it could some a very minor thing that you said was, you know, a little bit off, off topic or off color could lead to complete cancellation. If one person of influences, influence will say you should be canceled, then you will be canceled. And it's just really hard to get out of that. And you make, in, in a situation like that, I'm not sure what to do. Like I, uh, you know, hope that will never happen to me. And I know I have a lot of support, but it is nice to get support even privately. So if I see a person being scrutinized for something minor i try to send them a direct message and you know some some words of support like you know to, 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 and shutting down twitter or setting it to private does help because at least it sort of uh you're then alone with your followers not not random trolls who will add uh you know oil to the fire and and and, and blow up the whole thing and, and it sort of 
calms down the whole Twitter storm a little bit. But but it's tough. Every situation deals for something different. And I know that the work that I do will make people unhappy. I criticize other people's papers and I might find errors. And I've been criticized before and it's not fun if somebody finds an error in your own paper. Uh, I've been on the other side. But I've also been falsely accused of all kinds of things that are, you know, I've been accused of plagiarism and and strange things in my in my blood scans, um, which turn out to be artifacts. So I, you know, it's not fun to be on the receiving end of that. I totally get that. But I, again, I always tell myself if if these people lash out to me, the 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 person who raises the concern, it means they have no scientific defense because they could take away my concerns by sharing original blots by saying, okay, well. Yeah, you th- you you say that these things look similar, but here's the original scan, and look, they're you know in high resolution. These things are actually very different. So tell me that in a convincing way, and I'll be happy. But yeah, if they lash out to me, that means they might have something to hide. So that is what I keep on telling me myself. Are there? I mean, I, I agree in principle. I'm just curious right now. I'm just wondering whether there is maybe some situation. I mean. Yeah, as I say, I completely agree. Like, if they, you know, if you made an error, just go over your data again, and maybe it takes a week or whatever, or a month, or you know, sometimes you have stuff to do. But there are definitely other ways of dealing with it. I'm just curious: is there a reason why you might not, you know, be able to? I mean, like, if you don't have the originals and the papers, the only thing you have is that maybe a reason where you just can't say anything other than like, yeah, no, you're wrong. I mean. Did you see what I'm trying to get at? Um, yeah. I I always hope that the author will answer. And I've had a couple of cases where an author uh, immediately replies, let's say on PubPeer, where I've posted my concern, and, and the senior author writes in and said, oh, this looks very seriously. I'm going to look into this. And I think that's a good answer. That's a, you know, I know these things might take time. Maybe the originals were already lost because they're old but i feel that's that sounds genuine but that is very rare that that happens so so what is the response then well i guess you said you don't really contact the authors that much directly anymore but i also had a question about the last part in some sense of reactions to your work as journals and how they react to you you know flagging some stuff uh that i mean Probably in most cases, the editors had actually nothing to do with because it happened in like the previous 10 years or whatever. I could imagine that happens often. Yes. Um, but kind of how how do journals react to, you know, you being, be, to being sent an email saying like, hey, you want to look <laughs> at this fraud in your journal? Or not fraud. <laughs> well, that's not how I word yeah, yeah, it. <laughs> I know, no, I was saying, you, you wouldn't word it that yeah. way. But someone saying like, you know, here's the major concern. What's the kind of typical reaction you can expect? Uh, nowadays I ask for confirmation that they at least got the email and even that doesn't always happen. Uh, there seems to be some, some, some of the editors who are either very silent or they don't want to deal with this little annoying email or, or they will say, okay, thank you. We got the email. We'll look into that. And then nothing happens. And so that that was the typical response for the the set of papers, the initial set that I sent uh, in 2014 and 15. In most cases, there was no response at all, and I sent a reminder like a year or so later in 2016 or 17, and asking them again for a reply, and and that led to even more silence. So that was frustrating. But like you said, in in many of these cases, the leadership of some journals slowly changes over time. There might be a new editor-in-chief and there might be just a whole new set of people uh, running the journal. And it feels that journals are now a little bit more open to these criticism and then that they're starting to see that the concerns I'm raising and many others are raising are legit and they, you know, these are things that slip through the cracks and slip through the, the normal... Uh, safeguards that were set up at the journal and 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 they they have to then of course admit that some some things were not caught during peer review or the editorial process in the past which is not fun i i understand that but i do think that there's a growing understanding of journals yeah there are there will be 
some small percentage of papers that we'll receive on our desks as manuscripts that will contain fraud. And we need to screen for that. And we just need to be aware that some of these might be fake. And I think like with any credit card scams, you have to hear about a certain scam and then you recognize it and you say, aha, I did not win $200 million from a a prince in Nigeria. I know this is a scam. So similarly, if you know certain things are scams, you will recognize them. And so editors are increasingly recognizing that the problems we're raising are real, that part of this could be caused by honest error, but another part of that could be caused by an intention to mislead. And they should look into it because I do keep track of how journals respond. And that's sort of my final sentence now when I send my standard email. I do keep track of of what you're going to do with this. And then one editor wrote back, that sounds like you're blackmailing me. I'm like, dude, I'm just keeping track of your customer response. Like that's, I'm not blackmailing you. If you handle it well, you'll end up well in my statistics. But that seems to motivate a couple of editors. But yeah, there's still a couple of very unwilling editors who do not who do not see that these are problems who will write to me one even wrote back saying well you're writing to me from a gmail account you're not an academic and so i'm not going to listen to you i'm like i have a phd yeah i work as a consultant but my concerns are real it doesn't matter who i am you know and yeah. even if it does matter i think i've earned some recognition from the scientific community that I'm just not a crazy woman sending you these things. No, I, I, I have legit concerns about this paper and it doesn't matter who sends it to you. You have to respond to it. Yeah. I mean, it's such a disappointing response in particular because I mean, I never use my institutional email <laughs> to start with <laughs> yeah, because, because, you know, I'm a, in a PhD phase, you know, you move and that kind of stuff. And I've lost. So I exactly, think you mentioned yeah. at some point you lost all your correspondence from your Stanford email. I did. Um, so yeah. I've had the same thing where, you know, often minor things, but sometimes it caused like some minor problems because I switched email. So now I just always use my private email. But again, as I said, like it's, it's deflecting away from the actual criticism towards stuff like proxies of prestige and or anything like that yeah i i some of the authors whose work i've criticized will uh say online that i'm a failed scientist of medium intelligence and uh there was one particular person who said that that's and, not too bad medium and, uh what's that <laughs> medium intelligence isn't too bad <laughs> medium intelligence yeah i don't know I, I, this is a person who claims uh he has a iq of i don't know 180 or so that's pretty high and yeah who can beat that it's pretty high yeah but uh, you know does that make him a better scientist not necessarily yeah, yeah, but yeah and but getting back to per- the criticism what do you have to say about that <laughs> <laughs> exactly so so they're trying to deflect on how many papers they have published and Uh what their age index is and i've only published 40 papers you know i think that's decent uh, especially since i left academia a couple of years ago i think uh, 40 papers you know it's i'm not gonna end up in the top 10 (laughs) of scientists obviously but i i did do science and i have my phd and i think that's all that matters and even if you don't have a phd if you see a big problem in a paper it totally doesn't matter who you are if you're a scientist or send it from an institutional email or not that doesn't matter. It's it's about the problem. So the deflection on who sends these emails is all, in my opinion, an unwillingness to deal with the actual problem. And so if people do that, I will bite even harder my teeth into the problem and I will search deeper because I that's just not the response I like to hear. So it's in the end not going to help them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the criticism that you only have published 40 papers is actually pretty... It's a, it's a pretty impressively dumb statement to make, just because, as you said, like it, you know, it doesn't address the problem in itself. And even then, like, forty papers shows you've clearly been in academia and science for a long time. <laughs> like, you, you know, you're not just a random person. I mean, yeah. Anyway, well, and even a random person again. Uh, I mean, some people doing doing this science criticism criticism work are not scientists, and they. You know, they they had to perhaps learn a little bit more on the background on how to interpret images and and problems, but they're equally good in finding the problems. It doesn't matter who you are. Yeah, I just find the idea funny of deflecting towards something that doesn't really show what they want to show. Yes. 
And I think recognizing that it is a deflecting of the of the problem is a very important one for me to keep on going. And uh, yeah, again, this I think this technique of bullying and sort of creating this air of I'm an authority and you're a nobody, that might work in certain circumstances. It might work when you're young and you're uh, perhaps early in your career and you are very impressed by, by such a person. But I just don't give a fork. And uh, and I think they sometimes forget that I I have done this for a long time. And it's it's like, I don't really care what you're trying to impress me with because you cannot break my career because I don't really have one. Like, uh, you know, I'm, I don't, I'm not dependent on your letter of recommendation. And that makes me in a lucky situation. Like I'm not dependent on the judgment of these people to continue my career. I'm actually in a very late stage of my career and uh, I already did my PhD and everything. And I, you know, worked in academia and I don't really care what you think about me. I care about the problem in your paper. Can we focus on this particular problem? And I think that some of these people are very frustrated that their normal technique of bullying and trying to impress me does not work always on me. Usually it doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me, you've kind of already said this also, that your kind of outsider's perspective in the sense that, you know, you're not reliant on trying to publish in that journal or anything like that. That gives you a lot of, not exactly leverage, but it just takes away most of the bad strategies you might have to respond to this kind of criticism. Exactly. If I was still earlier in my career or dependent on what a very prominent researcher thought of me, I would be in a much more vulnerable situation because that would, you know, one letter from a very respected professor to another professor where I might want to work, that could damage my career greatly. And I can see that when I was much earlier in my career, I could not do the work I'm doing now. Or I would have a boss saying, uh, you know, don't touch that particular researcher because we're working, we're collaborating with them. And, you know, or uh, she's such a nice woman or he's such a nice pal or no, I, I don't really have those worries to deal with. Like if I see a problem, I don't really care who that person is. If they have won a Nobel prize or if they are an early career researcher, I will focus on the papers and the problems, not on the people, but I will, I will call that out. Actually, a brief question here about, you know, when you find something, not, not you specifically, but other people, um, you know, people who might be in this kind of more vulnerable position. In my example, uh, it's not exactly that way. Uh, the people are a lot more, are very senior now, but it's exact, it's not exactly my field. So I don't really, I'm probably not going to come across them much anyway. So it's not that much of a risk, I don't think. But what, what should people do if they are? in that position you know let's say you're a phd student and it's in your field and a very respected person would you even recommend they actually do anything about it or i mean i for example i i talked to joe hilgard about this very early on in my podcast and he basically said like you know what it's probably not worth it <laughs> like from all his experience he's like it just takes lots of time uh you potentially risk uh upsetting the wrong people and even if that doesn't happen, there's not that high of a chance of anything actually changing or happening. And I think that's a, a decent point to make because academia is so hierarchical. We're so dependent on other people's opinions who are above us. And so if we criticize those people, we will be seen as troublemakers and it could severely damage one's career if, if your early career. And so I would definitely not recommend writing to the authors in that case, uh, I would not recommend writing even to an editor uh, anonymously or under your full name because it's going to be a tough case. But you could still post on Papier anonymously. You, will, you can create an anonymous account. And as long as the problems that you want to raise are visible from the paper itself, um, not inside information, but visible for anybody to look at, then you can report it anonymously and you can make a point and, and nobody will know who you are. Even if Papier would be subpoenaed, they do not keep track of your IP address or things like that. You will just be assigned a passcode. And with that passcode, which you, you know, sort of like your, uh, I don't know, your Bitcoin, uh, how do you call that? Like code, you have to keep that really, uh, yeah, really careful. And then you, 
you can log in with that code and then you will uh, always have that particular name. You will be assigned the name of an organism from the tree of life. So you cannot choose what your username will be, but it might be a fungus, I always say, <laughs> or, uh, or a bacterium. And so then you can comment on that paper and that is completely anonymously. And then hopefully the author will reply, but as I already talked about, we they usually don't. But if they do, then hopefully they will have a good answer. And the best you can do is then at least warn other people because now there is a papier record and there's a public comment that other people can look at. Yeah, I was, I was curious like how so papier is actually completely anonymous if you want it to be. I mean, it sounds like if you, you can want it to be, yes. make it also under your name or whatever. Yes, you can You can choose two types of uh, comments. So I usually comment under my full name. When I was a little bit earlier in doing this type of work, I have created a couple of anonymous accounts. So I have a couple of these fungus names or bacteria. And I, uh, when I have commented on a paper, I will then use that account to comment if I find another problem because I don't want to do sock puppetry you know, where it looks like I have that multiple accounts agree with me. No, I do want to, I will keep then that um, that one account to comment on it. And I use that for some of the authors who are very particularly litigious, so who would be very likely to sue me. Uh, now I'm a little bit less worried about that, even though I'm sure it will happen at some point, like we have seen with the Data Colada team, who are now being sued by one of the professors whose work they criticized. So I have not been sued, but uh, yeah, I'm careful with some of the authors. So I'll use an anonymous account. Would you recommend something like, let's say you put it on Puppier, but I mean, to be fair, I've heard of Puppier for a while, but I've never really been on the website or maybe I might've been once or twice, but like, it's, I don't think it's like in the uh, conscious awareness of most scientists that, you know, they can look for a random paper, like for a given paper on this. Would you recommend, let's say I want to contact the journal and make sure they get it. Would you recommend something like, uh, these like uh, short-term anonymous email addresses, or is that also just a silly idea that's not going to lead anywhere? Yeah, it 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 could be because um, some journals keep track of what gets posted about their papers on papier, and others don't. Um, so it depends on the journal, and I I have no good memory. Like I think Plus One, for example, seems to carefully check that every now and then because they. Even if I haven't reported a paper to them, they are responding to it, so they might check it. Uh, but other journals don't. So it is definitely a good idea to send it to the journal as well. But it, it unfortunately, if you send an anonymous email, let's say you create a Proton email account or some throwaway, so throwaway Gmail account, some journal editors will not be very uh, tempted to, to take action even though it, it, it is always worth pointing out the COPE guidelines. Again, the Committee on Publication Ethics has guidelines for how to deal with anonymous reporters. And so to include, include a little link to that uh, website, like if your journal is a member of COPE, you have to respond to this. You have to take action, even though this is an anonymous email address. And it might be worth pointing that out. But yeah, some editors are just not very willing to investigate it, especially when it's an anonymous email. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it seems like more like a last uh, resort. I mean, we've talked mainly so far about, actually not that much about your duplications, but I guess we've talked about it fairly vaguely in terms of like the most common things like plagiarism, duplications, uh, things that I found that are just kind of like statistical inconsistencies. Uh, what, I mean, <laughs> not that we want to necessarily encourage people to just go and report everything, but what are kind of some other things that maybe are worth pointing out that are wrong in papers one might read that get a little less attention? Uh, there's many things that can be wrong in, in scientific papers. Um, I mean, in a way that, 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 that is worth like reporting, maybe. I mean, obviously, you might disagree with someone's interpretation or that kind of thing, but that's sure. not, you know. No, so so some of the errors I've also reported on are, um, let's say, methodology. So let's say you have a paper where there's no control group. There's just a group of patients who have, let's say, long COVID or some other disease, and they're being treated with some magical co magical cocktail. And um, uh, they're, they're treated for a year, and after a year, um, a lot of these patients are doing feeling much better. 
Now, is that because they're, you know, they're slowly getting better from long COVID just by themselves? Or is it because of the magical cocktail? And it's really hard if there's no control group. So you you cannot really do good science if you don't have that, that set of control. So you have to have a, a set of people who you don't treat with. That would be a good... That's very basic science. That's how we teach, uh, you know, people to do science. You have to, if you do one thing to one group of patients, you have to not do the other thing. And there's a whole, sometimes it's not ethical to do nothing to the other people, but like to have one set of patients treated with the normal way you would treat these patients with, and then have a new device or a new drug. But have to you have to have these two groups to compare it to each other. Otherwise you have no idea what the effect of your magical cocktail of drugs is and you know maybe they it would have helped them anyways if you had not treated them so that's a very basic thing uh, that could be wrong with a paper and definitely worth pointing out and then um, there could be a problem where there is a control group but the control group is much sicker than the people you're treating and so if there's already a difference between the control group and the treatment group at the beginning of the experiment, you know, then you can also raise questions. That is not good either. Like if they are much older or much younger or much sicker or have live in a different city or are much more educated or more um, uh, have a higher income, all those things could already make a big difference on, on a group of patients. Um, other things that could be wrong is like lack of ethical approval. If you do an experiment on animals or on human subjects. Uh, nowadays, you have to have, you have to follow the rules, you have to have the right permits, you have to have the right consents, you have to have approval from either your institution or a regional organization that will give these approval and make sure that you're doing experiments according to all the ethical rules that we have in place to treat humans uh, fairly and, you know, make them aware of potential risks or to treat animals fairly and not do any unnecessary experiments. So those are things I've found wrong as well. I mean, where do you draw the line there, right? I mean, for example, let's say control group, I think is a classic example where there is basically no perfect control group in almost any study. Uh, you know, there's always going to be some sort of difference uh, between groups um, and some control groups will be better than others. Uh, where do you draw, the, you know, this is a continuous problem that at some point you have to make a cut off and say like, okay, this is so bad. Like <laughs> this, something has to be pointed <laughs> out here. Uh, so first of all, like where do you draw that line? And then secondly, related to this, you know, when is it something you might mention to someone you talk to versus post on Twitter versus make a pub peer post and that kind of stuff? Um, I feel I, I have a, you know, there's most scientists will have a decent sense for what is, you know, not ideal versus what is really complete sloppiness. So yeah, having no control group or a control group that is very different from the treatment group, that is usually very obvious. I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, the age of one group is 39.7 years and the other one is 41.3, even though that is perhaps statistically different depending on the number of subjects. But if one is 65 and the other is 33, that seems like a huge difference that could make, that would be worth pointing out. So I'm sure there is a gray zone, um, but the examples I've been pointing out are so extreme that I feel it's very obvious that we, we have a problem here. <laughs> uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to not nitpick. Uh, usually when I have a group of authors that I'm suspecting are cutting corners or are doing deliberately things uh, wrong with an intention to mislead, you will find more problems that by itself might not be that big. Like one was in COVID times where it seems that approval was given one day after the study had started, but it was in, you know, in the, in the, in 2020. So when COVID just started, it was perhaps in panic mode. I can see by itself, that is not a reason to criticize a paper. You can sort of see people were you know, desperate and okay, maybe we could cut some corners, but there were many other problems in the paper. And so I will include such a perhaps by itself smallish thing, because I think there's a larger picture where other things are wrong. And then we can, you know, we can point out some other uh, faults in a, uh, in a paper as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So kind of once it 
reaches some sort of critical mass where you go like this there's just something wrong here with the paper whether it's lots of individual small things kind of similar to what i have almost um none of them by itself is too bad um mm -hmm. but on mass you go exactly like, what did they get right <laughs> Um, right and then then you could even point out a little typo which by itself you know we all know it's a typo it's fine we're we're not going to care about that but yeah once like you said once you've seen other problems then you're just gonna put all of them there because it just it adds to the feeling that a paper is just not handled carefully that there's sloppiness um uh, or even an intention to mislead but even sloppiness is is worth pointing out because we we need to be careful, right, with our studies. And especially when you work with humans, humans, uh, you know, human subjects or with animals, we have a responsibility to do our experiments correctly and not waste materials, not waste the quality of life, not endanger the, the, the lives of patients. We have a responsibility to do ethical research and to do ethical reporting and, and be as close to the truth as we possibly can. Yeah. So as we mentioned in the beginning, you now do this full time, you know, you're not working main time full time as a, as a scientist. And then you do this, you know, on a, on a relaxed Sunday afternoon. Um, <laughs> uh, Chris, who hires a research integrity consultant? Well, so I, I do sometimes work for universities or publishers or journals or editors who are investigating very specific cases of allegations of misconduct. So, for example, a another person doing similar work as I do has perhaps criticized the work of a particular scientist at a university or a set of papers at a particular uh, publisher and they might want to hire an expert to sort of as a second opinion, like are these concerns that were raised legit? Do we have a legal case? Like they might want to have a report written by a person, you know, who is somewhat credible. So I hope that person could be me. And and so similarly to, to any other case that you want to investigate, you want to have an expert opinion like maybe a pathologist, you know, looking at a dead body, like how did the person die? You want to hire a person who could write a little report that will help the whole investigation move forward. And so I, I am sometimes hired to do that. I've worked with um, lawyers in the past who also had like a client accused and they wanted to perhaps make a particular case that, uh, you know, other people do it too or th things like that. If they <laughs> If there's just a general... A general atmosphere of cheating in that lab and so maybe they want to look at other papers from that lab and sort of prove that it wasn't the client it was somebody else and if i find other problems or if i don't like i'll just report what i find very honestly i've also given talks for universities publishers etc either um, sometimes at at conferences keynote speak uh, uh, speaking opportunities so i get a honoraria to give talks i've also worked with journals on guidelines um, for, let's say, image preparation. How can we, as a journal, have better guidelines so that we can circumvent problems of, you know, cropping too tightly or changing the contrast? What is allowed? What is not allowed? Have very clear guidelines is going to help everybody to, you know, move forward in a way that is more close to the truth. So those are all kinds of things that I make money with. Um, and then I have a Patreon account, which is sort of crowdfunding where people donate. Usually it's graduate students, postdocs. Uh, I get a lot of people supporting me and all together that gives me sort of a, a basic income as well. So it's a combination of consulting work and crowdfunding that, um, you know, that uh, funds my work. How interested are journals and universities in this kind of stuff? Because Part of me thinks that, you know, for them, it's still a bit of a nuisance, but I also feel like they must see that this has just increased so much over the past, let's say, 10, 15 years, that I feel like an intelligent editor of a journal would say like, okay, let's maybe, you know, make sure that, yeah, we have, as you kind of already said, some of the right procedures in place. And yeah, is is it something you feel like they're really interested in? Or is it just like occasionally a journal? <laughs> yeah. 
they're they're more and more interested in it. Yeah, just because they want to they want to prevent these things for, from being published in the first place. And if you catch these things before they get published, that's much better for all the parties involved, including the authors. And you know, you want to catch these things before they're in the public domain. And so journals, publishers, um, and institutions are more and more interested in hiring specific people, hiring staff who are specifically looking at papers from that point of view. Could it be fraud? Is there a, pro- a potential problem with the, with the manuscript? And catch these things before they get published. So it is actually a, there's a growing interest in hiring people for those roles so that they, they're not dependent on on outside expert, but they have a person within their organization that will look at these things. Mm-hmm. Let's say someone listening is interested in this and thinks maybe not exactly what you do with image duplication, but you know, that kind of stuff sounds very cool. I would also like to be <laughs> someone who gets abused online and then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, why not? Yeah, and, and gets little paid. Yeah, exactly. sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, what's but, not to love? Um, yeah. <laughs> How, what, what, what could they do to go about this? I mean, is there, are there already, you know, positions at universities or yeah, how can you kind of get into that? Is it just doing it on PubP and hope that something happens or? So I would say that you have to have some background in science before you can do this and, and, and some experience. So you, I don't think it would be a good job to work as a research integrity officer or online detective as I do, you know, straight out of grad school. So I would say it is good to have some experience doing research yourself under the belt. But um, having said that, yeah, there, I would not recommend doing what I do as, as an early career researcher because you have to be in a position that you don't really care about not publishing anymore, but about criticizing other people. So if you want to do that, sure, start doing it you know, on if, if you have some free time, you could start looking just at papier. What gets published there? You could just sort of see every paper as it as it appears online and what people have to say about it. I think that's a wonderful way of learning what type of problems you might look at. Uh, again, if you recognize them, you can better recognize them yourself and and find more of them. So you sort of learn by what other people are posting and how they formulate their concerns. Uh, yeah, do it as a hobby. But if you are really interested in having this type of work as a career, uh, some publishers are hiring people who will look at papers from the point of view that it could be fraud from, you know, scanning papers for image problems uh, to uh, making sure that the papers that they cite have, you know, are not excessively only by themselves, that the peer reviewers are not fake accounts created by the authors themselves, all these types of frauds that you can think of. So there are people at, at, at journals doing that. There's also research integrity officers at universities whose role is more of providing guidance and teaching uh, graduate students how to do ethical research how you know like write these codes of conduct write guidelines on how to deal with potential allegations of misconduct so that's more of a it's not like i for me it doesn't sound much as much fun it's more dealing with uh, protocols and and um, developing online courses and things like that but if that's what you like then there is definitely there are careers in that at universities okay one question I had is kind of it's it's a fairly kind of generic question I think about crimes in general. Uh, whenever kind of any you know methods for detecting fraud or that kind of stuff are published and talked about openly, then in some sense there's the question of whether we're just teaching the the criminals, and now we can actually talk about let's hypothetical criminal and not just someone who makes an error. We're just teaching them to become better fraudsters and to hide uh, what they do better. You know, it seems that there's always kind of a bit of an arm race between the people committing fraud and the people detecting fraud. So I'm, I'm just curious whether you, <laughs> whether you have any opinions on that. <laughs> should, should you oh, maybe yes. <laughs> be less public about it and kind of, uh, you know, oh, but you, okay. can you even do that? I don't know. Yeah. In a way, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I feel I'm only catching the really dumb fraudsters, but yeah, I'm also telling them how to fraud better. So, for example, there was this set of papers that 
Multiple people independently of each other discovered that all had Western blots, these protein blots, that all had different bands, but they were all put on the same background. So it appeared they had all been photoshopped. And so we, I wrote a blog post about it. I called this the tadpole paper mill they, because the, the, the protein bands looked like little baby frogs, like tadpoles. But the, the fraudsters had, had put all of these on the same background. So you could recognize at some point the background and say, aha, that, you know, they, these were all fabricated in the same lab or the same studio. And then these papers must have been sold to all these different authors working at different institutions. But of course, now we told them, like, okay, if you do that, we're going to catch you. So you have to fraud better. You have to put a little bit more effort in your background and and adding some variety in there as well. So we cannot catch you. So yeah, there, it's, it is always going to be an arms race. And it's like scams, online scams, the, the Nigerian print scam or, you know, phone scams. Uh, like your account has been hacked. Give me your password and I'll take care of it. We know that these are scams. If we tell other people, I mean, the, the point is to warn other people so that they're not going to fall for it, but there's always going to be a new scam. So there's just no way to prevent it. If we want to warn other people, we have to tell them why we found it. And and yeah, there always will be scammers, but we can work on other things like perhaps like pre-registration or just having less emphasis on things like you need to publish X amount of papers at this point in your career. If we focus less on on metrics, on quantity, but more on quality and more on reproducibility, these the incentives to do fraud might go away. And I hope we can move forward to a system where we can, for example, put a small, smallish experiment online and then other people can try to replicate it. And then if it's replicable... That means that my experiment was done correctly. It, and we all get you know credit for that, that not just me for doing the experiment, but for other people replicating it. And if we if we can work towards a system that is less dependent perhaps on scientific publications and impact factors and all these very easy to measure metrics, but that do not necessarily make me a better scientist, then we might slow down science a little bit, obviously, but we will make science better. So I hope we can move towards that system because then it's going to be much, much harder to do fraud if your experiment needs to be replicated in order to move forward. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm not even sure I'd agree with that it slows science down, right? I mean, or it's being slowed down now by lots of people trying to replicate stuff that they thought exactly. was a great no, finding. Exactly, a very good point. In the yeah. famous, right? I mean, I know people who spent months trying to replicate something and, you know, maybe it just, for whatever reason, didn't replicate, but... Yeah, And there's many, many reasons why a paper cannot be replicated. And you can think about, you know, the secret sauce that we add or the secret little flick that we give to our tube that actually does uh, make a difference. Or I've heard about the amount of ozone in the air. You know, you have a printer somewhere in the admin office next door to your lab that is actually creating a lot of ozone that might um, inhibit your experiment. And you have no idea why it doesn't work. In your lab. So you don't always know what is the reason. And it is definitely not always fraud. It could be many different things that you just don't realize might make uh might make a difference. And and so, but it is very hard to replicate experiments, as we have all dealt with. And and you're right, that also slows down science, but it's not very visible because we tend to only report the positive things and not the many hours that we tried replicating something that didn't work. Yeah, I always find it so interesting with going back to kind of the initial question with kind of teaching people how to commit better fraud. Um, I mean, I think I started my episode with Joe Hilgard asking him whether he could commit fraud and get away with it. And he was like, oh, yeah, it's easy. <laughs> you know, you oh, you, I could yeah. I could easily do that too. You really yes. don't need to know that much to <laughs> yeah. just don't be a complete moron, basically, then you can exactly. get away with it. And most, and most scientists are smart, right? Like, like, I might be catching the dumb fraudsters, um, but most scientists are pretty smart. And so it must mean for every paper we catch that has a visible problem with it, like uh, a repeated row in a table or a overlapping set of microscopy images, you know, for every one we catch, there must be a lot more that we don't catch. So we're really only catching the tip of the iceberg. 
and again, some of this might be honest errors, but there's a lot of ways to do fraud, unfortunately. <laughs> and that is what I'm not going to tell you, but uh, I think we can all come up with ways to do fraud that would absolutely not be visible in any way. Even, you know, we could do fraud that is not visible from looking at our lab books or only maybe if you look over my shoulder while I do the experiment, you could maybe catch me. But we can all think of ways of doing it. But I, I also know that most scientists are honest. We're not doing fraud. Uh, we know some of us might massage the data a little bit or tweak it, but we're not in science because we want to do fraud. We are in science because we we have this idealistic feeling that we want to improve the world and make, you know, make us healthier and make the world a better place to live. At least I feel that very strongly. And I hope most scientists do that too. I don't think people are in, in the field of science to do fraud. Most people. <laughs> I mean, I think, yeah, I think we can say most people aren't in science to commit fraud. Yeah. I think that's a fairly good, fairly broad blanket statement <laughs> we can make. Uh, again, if they were, they could make a lot more money in other fields if they wanted to commit fraud. And there are people, there are people doing, there are, like we, we haven't even talked about paper mills. Uh, well, a little bit. I, I talked about the tadpole paper mill, but there are people who, deliberately are creating fake pa papers and selling those fake papers, selling the authorships to people who need them. And so the, the authors on those papers just give uh, the those paper mill scammers some money. Now their, their name is being put on that paper and now they have a paper and they can continue their career. Maybe now they can do, become a PhD or they can... They can go to medical school or finish uh, their medical school because now they have a paper and they don't really care whether or not the paper is fake or even in their own field. So, so you see these papers that have like multiple authors from multiple countries and multiple institutions that would have been very unlikely to have found together, uh, found each other in real life, like how their, their, uh, affiliations do not match really the paper. Let's say it's a paper about, I don't know, electrical vehicles and they work in the department of uh, psychiatry. And we're like, oh, how do you publish a paper about electrical vehicles? doesn't really make a lot of sense. So those are signs of uh, those papers being completely fake and being sold to whoever wants to pay money to become yeah, an author. I mean, even though I don't know much about it, but I, um, a friend of mine who works in publishing um for scient or worked for scientific reports, for example, said that they had a massive problem with paper mills because I think people there, kind of the the fraudsters, were being intelligent because they didn't try and get it into nature. They tried to get it into the kind of journal that's good enough. No one's going to pay too close of attention if something's slightly off. So yeah, unless you're like, was it Dietrich Stapel who was publishing in Science and that kind of stuff with just made up stuff? Yeah, as long as you yeah. don't do that again, just, <laughs> as long as you avoid the really dumb mistakes. You can get away with it. And I think that's the nice positive note we're going to end on. If you want to commit science, you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you might be caught. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Don't leave any traces for us to find. Yeah, yeah don't, don't duplicate images. I think that's that should be out <laughs> for now. Um, uh, I have recurring questions. Um, first question is a book or paper that you think more people should read. It can basically be anything, something old, new, very famous. No one ever knows about it. Uh, just something you think that should be read more. Uh, I I really like Plastic Fantastic. So that's a book about one of the science frauds. So it's about um, Jan Hendrik Schön, who was a, a physicist. He worked at Bell Labs, and he was found to to fake results. And he published in Nature and Science. And he was caught because he did um, he published a couple of times the same graph. And he was caught and he was always, he was never seen in the lab, but then the next day, suddenly he had this beautiful graph and people thought he was a fantastic researcher and he won some awards. And, but then people were like, wait, are you really doing those experiments or just drawing a graph? And it turns out he did the last, uh, the latter. And, um, so the book is from, um, uh, Eugenie, uh, Reich, who is a journalist and now also a lawyer in science misconduct. And it's, it's a really Nice story. I don't read a lot of books, but what I liked about it is you can sort of see how a person is allowed to be cheating because everybody wanted this person to be a brilliant scientist, but also how hard it was for several whistleblowers 
to raise the alarm and how they were not believed by the the leadership at Bell Labs. They they were sent away like, well, you're just, you know, you might not see him in the lab, but maybe he does the experiments at night. And and then finally, it took multiple rounds of people raising the alarm before there was an actual investigation. And it turned out he was a fraud. But the frustration of the whistleblower being sent away and not believed, I felt was was something I could relate with a lot. And so uh, Plastic Fantastic. I, I really enjoyed that book. It's about, uh, I think, semiconductors in plastic. And um, I don't quite understand the science behind it, but the whole story about about a person cheating, about the whistleblowers trying to raise the alarm and 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 finally the detective work. I think that's a very interesting story that applies to a lot of cases of misconduct. Great. I think Samin mentioned that one. Or well, someone did. Oh. Someone did? I think I've definitely I can't remember who, but I've definitely this book has been recommended before. Uh so yeah, definitely go read it. I haven't read it yet, but I guess now I have to. Okay, now it's been well. recommended twice. <laughs> that's maybe yes. that's the that's the test. Uh, second question: Something you wish you'd learned sooner. Uh, this you know, could be from any from any realm of life you want to <laughs> answer. Um, but yeah, just something you went like, oh, if I learned that, just a you know, a bit sooner, that would have helped me out quite a bit. I think there's that there's just that there is cheating in science. I think I was shocked the first time when I found out because you know I know that people cheat. That uh, although I still remember when I was like eight or nine years old, that I was completely shocked that people were cheating on their tests in elementary school. Like, why did do people do that? But um, to be learning that scientists are cheating too, that was a shock to me. And now, of course, I I work in this field, so I I know it's happening. <laughs> yeah, I hope you're aware of it now. But I was just shocked. Like I just thought, like I said before, that everybody working in science is doing it for some idealistic reason and that you know you shouldn't be cheating in science because for me science is about finding the truth and just cheating is just not the way to do that and so i wish i had learned that sooner and i guess also that people are are just lying and lying just to to uh if people lie then they will lie again like they might provide you with an original and say, well, see, the original is is different, but the original might actually also be photoshopped, as I've learned. If people lie in their papers, they're going to lie with the evidence that they're prevent, uh, presenting to you. So I think those are things that I've learned along the way, and I wish I had known them a little bit earlier. Mm. By the way, just a brief question there. Does, does working on scientific fraud all the time make you a bit cynical? Or kind of take um, a negative view. I've always been very cynical. Thing. No, but you know what I mean. Uh, right? no, I, because I, you like yeah, see yeah, so no, much, I know. and you have to question. You know, as you just said, this kind of like, well, are they telling the truth now, or is this another lie? <laughs> I, um, I, I probably am a little bit more cynical, but I still believe in science. Like I still know that almost all scientists are doing this out of, you know, out of a passion for for science, and we need science to solve all the big problems in the world. So even though I'm working on that perhaps smallish percentage of scientists who do bad things, I'm still very passionate about science in general. And and so I think that is something important to that you might not get from listening to me talk about, you know, science fraud for 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 a long time. I I am a scientist myself and I have met so many great and honest and Scientists who struggle also sometimes with questions like we all do, like, can we leave out this outlier? Can we, uh, if we take out this experiment and everything looks better, is that allowed or is that science fraud? And I think all of us are struggling with that fine line. Like, when do we cross the line? When when are we still good? And so that is, um, yeah, no, I, I, I believe in science and I will defend science <laughs> till my last breath. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit more cynical, cynical and I just you know, trust, but verify. Like I like to verify things. If if people make statements online, I like to ask them for the references. And, you know, if they're from certain sources, I might not tend to believe them. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't, uh, you know, that, that wasn't, uh, my question wasn't a response to me getting that impression I was talking to you, but <laughs> I guess there is always this like question of like how one's work changes, how one views the world. But it's nice that you managed to not like <laughs> you know, let that seep into you. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah. Uh, final question. Any advice for 
basically people like me, uh, people like advanced PhD students, maybe early postdocs, people on that kind of transition. What would you say? Anything you, you would like to tell those people? Well, very basically, if you're thinking about joining a particular lab, um, I would do a quick pop, pop peer search to see if, uh, you know, <laughs> if, is the lab with a lot of pop peer comments and potential misconduct? Uh, don't join that lab. That's pretty obvious. Um, Unless you want to be investigative. Uh, fraud sure finder. if you want to be yeah but it's not gonna it's not gonna end well for, for any of the parties <laughs> okay. involved i'm sure um but um yeah so pick your next lab carefully interview with people not just the you know who will be your manager or your pi but also other people working in that lab what is the what is the atmosphere the 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 culture of that lab is it one of of respect of support of mentoring or is it one of bullying, you know, very high expectations of working in the weekends or working day and night and uh, never taking a day off and never allowing a sick day, just having to work day and night and, and in the weekends and having to supply the PI with results that they expect? Because I think if you work in a lab like that, it's just not good for your men mental health. You want to have a lab where... There is support from your PI, even if the results you bring him or her are not the ones they had hoped for. Like, how does the PI deal with that? How are you expected to give them those results that they want? Or is it okay to fail and to retry? And uh, and are, yeah, are you mentored? Are you being supervised with the way? And, and of course, when you get along in your career you need a little bit less of mentoring and supervising but we all need to to be helped and and supervised and as if you are dealing with a person who is a bully who is your boss that is just not a good situation so if a person tells you uh, a person of authority tells you this is how we all do science we all cheat um that is actually incorrect we don't all cheat no uh, get out of that lab as if you can as soon or as don't get into it but it's tough don't get into it as at all so interview people <laughs> do you commit fraud in this lab <laughs> well you're that's not a, perhaps a good uh, question to answer but like if you if you can interview with people who have worked in that lab recently or have maybe uh, moved on are these people who also start their own labs or did everybody work in that lab leave academia altogether um you know you can sort of picture out if the leader of the lab the group leader the professor is that a good mentor for for his or her grad students and postdocs do do they get the supervision so they can then also become successful further on in their career or do they all leave science and academia uh, at all and not even end up in in what we call alternative careers which are very decent careers as well with a, a phd but if everybody starts a coffee shop after working in this lab, then maybe there's something wrong <laughs> in that lab. I don't know. Yeah. And this is not an ex not a hypothetical example either. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, with that, uh, thank you very much. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, no, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs>